Thank you very much. I'm going to follow on some of the things that, that Rob was talking about, but let's also shift gears and talk a little bit more about um, the relationship between judges and dictionaries. Uh, judges love dictionaries. <laughs> the 
expression use a firearm, they, 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 they confuse the two uh, perniciously. It's not, it matters if they use the phrase or just the word. Um, and what really carries the ordinary usage, not the, not the outer boundaries of the word, but how do you usually do this? And now, then he they asked these, these very sweet questions. Um, well, if he used a gun to scratch his head, would he still be put away for 30 years? And so on. And the, um, eventually, um, he lost, and the guy's still in prison. <coughs> because he's in parole. So the next case comes up. And that case, um, in, in the second case, somebody had a gun in the glove compartment and the drugs in the trunk of or the reverse. And he was driving, I can't remember. And he was driving to the crime scene. It's pulled over. And he, and the, and the cops are like, well, this is a free court. Well, let us, well, let us get away with anything. So the prosecutors prosecute him for using a gun. And at that point, the linguist Charles Fillmore gets involved with the law professor named Cunningham. And they present the court with the sentence I use a gun to protect my house, but I've never had to use it. <laughs> and the court said, well, at least when the guy was trading the gun, Smith was the guy trading the gun, Daly was the guy with the guns in the car, at least when he was trading the gun, he was doing something active with it. Whereas if I use a gun to protect my house, I've never had to use it, the first instance of use is, um, and then they look it up in another 16 dictionary. And the first instance of use is not active. It really means I have a gun to protect my house, but I've never had to do anything active with it. We're going to take the word use in that statute at least to mean something active. So now, the statute actually doesn't just say use. It says use or carry a gun during or in relation to a drug trafficking crime. So they, they wise up. And in the third case, it's called Muscarello, they they um, accuse Muscarello, same thing with the car, the gun on one part of the car, the, 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 the drugs on the other part of the car. They accuse him of carrying a gun. Nine, nothing, the judges agree that what we care about is not the outer boundaries of the meaning, but the ordinary sense of the word, because the ordinary sense of the word probably reflects the best as to what the members of Congress had in mind when they enacted the statute. Nine, nothing, that that's how you look at it, but five, four about what the ordinary meaning is. And they look it up at a host of dictionaries and get angry at each other as to what dictionaries you're using. How dare you use Webster's third? Did you ever read the book eight? I still use Webster's second. Heritage dictionary is my hero. Black's Law Dictionary is a terrible outlier and is a disgrace to the community. And so on, back and forth about dictionaries. And then one of those, you know, new quotes from Albert, Albert Goldsmith, and another one quotes from Daniel Defoe, and they both find passages from the Bible because if it, 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 it carries uh, a corpse on a donkey, if it's good enough for God, it's good enough for the Supreme Court of the United States. They're going back and forth. And in that case, Justice Breyer, in his majority opinion, uh, for conviction, that guy went away also in the five four decision, Justice Breyer um, said, I did a Lexus search, or a Westlaw search, in the newspaper um, uh, library, and I found that the word carry, that the words carry and gun, are, when they're used together, at least a third of the time, the, you see them in the context of, 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 of carrying something in a vehicle. Or, or I'm sorry, not carry, yeah, carry a gun is carrying a vehicle at least a third of the time. In dissent, Justice Ginsburg says, oh, that happened in the other two thirds of the And that's really what the status is of dictionaries and the transition to using corpora. The use of dictionaries by judges is roundly criticized in the intellectual community. One article after another about how judges misuse dictionaries. And, and, and when you talk to people who write dictionaries, they give you enough examples. It's, um, it's not well received by the people who feel that their work is being used too aggressively because you get a certain number of lines on average per word. It's just an accident as to the way you, whether you characterize the word, will help one side of the case or another. And that's how many people in the field feel. So getting back to uh, Justice Breyer doing this Westlaw search, it's 
probably not such a bad thing to do. We should have just done it better because if you decide to look at a lot of great newspaper and magazine articles and really do some decent quantitative analysis, it might teach you something. Um, so, and you see other examples of this kind of thing happening as well. So Judge Posner um, comes out and, and he, he um, looks up words, on, he does a Google search and, and narrows it. Well, that's not the best corpus if you're being scientific, but you know, good enough for government work. And it's easy to, and, 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 and the results uh, made, made a, a fair amount of sense and it to do with work harder. Whether letting your boyfriend live with you, if your boyfriend's an illegal immigrant, does that include harboring somebody? And he said, you really don't talk that way about harboring, uh, using that kind of search. And finally, a justice on the Supreme Court of Utah just last year, uh, the case involved the word discharge. If somebody discharges a gun many times, just in a row, did, uh, they, they discharges it 12 times in a row, does the word discharge a firearm mean that he committed 12 crimes and can be, and can be sent away to prison forever? Or did he only just commit one crime of discharging, but discharged many times? That was the issue in that case. The court said no, it's multiple crimes ultimately, and Justice Lee agreed. But Justice Lee also, uh, being in Utah, and having been on the faculty of Brigham Young University, knows about corpus linguistics because some of the very large research corpora come out of Brigham Young University in particular, COCA, uh, the Corpus of Contemporary Art Language. And so he did a real corpus linguistic analysis of what was going on there with the use of discharge. And what happened was, the other justices who agreed with him said, I don't think you should have done that. You really have to know what you're doing before you do that. And maybe you do, maybe you don't, but don't you think the lawyer should be bringing it to our attention with cross-examination of experts and so on? Because how do we know what's going on? And how does the public know about the legitimacy of the court when it engages in this kind of scientific investigation? This has now become a very big issue. Judges and lawyers becoming their own lexicographers. It's not bad when in a situation like, no, that's okay, that's fine. When in the situation that Rob's talking about, there's nothing wrong if you're on the stand and you can be cross-examined and so on. When the judge brings it out, though, this is controversial, and there's a conference occurring at Brigham Young University soon about this featuring Justice Lee and, and so on. Well, at the same time at Brigham Young, they are now creating a new Corpus called the Corpus uh, Founding Era English, or American English, which is a hundred million words of 18th century language. And the idea is that people who have an originalist approach to the Constitution, which means you, what you try to find is what they call the original, the ordinary public meaning of the words. How would people have understood it? they were going to vote day or day to the Constitution around the country. And the way they look at it now is scholars and judges look it up in old dictionaries. They find old dictionaries and they, you know, and they draw inferences from that, and it's really not a very good way to go about things. Not because the dictionaries aren't neutral, but because they're not adequately informative to see how somebody in Connecticut or, or, or so on is going to understand these words. So they are now trying to bring corpus linguistics into the heart of a particular theory of constitutional interpretation so that the whole legal interpretive world will become corpus linguists and in, in, in some ways. Um, I've had some questions about that. There's a back and forth. I'm, I'm writing a, 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 a piece that's not skeptical, skeptical about the project. It's great that the court created corpus. But skeptical that once you have a hundred million words, it doesn't mean the lexicography is over. It means you then have decisions to make. And those decisions aren't always neutral. And if you're making the decisions when you have a stake in the outcome of a particular case, that's exactly what the good part of dictionary reference says you never had to do. So there's going to be a lot of debate about the use of um, electronic corpora and legal analysis. It's just going to start growing, starting in about two weeks when these publications start coming out. Um, and, the, and the fights over the dictionaries, I think all the judges now are so um, interested in dictionary work that even with Justice Scalia's death, it's, it's, it's well embedded in the, um, and the controversies will continue. Thanks so much.
if you don't use well-established reference dictionaries as a starting point to ascertain how a word or whatever is being used, what source can you tell me? What, what source, at, at this juncture, what source can you go to? Because even as, as a language professor, a linguist, you know, you have your course, you say, well, especially if there's regional differences and things like that, you say, well, there's some nebulosity about what this word means or could mean. What other, what other place can you look? I mean, like I said, using multiple dictionaries, I think, is a good answer because you get a well-rounded, and then that, that opens up the discussion. You know, because then it will be, like you said, someone will have, will have a, the proverbial dog in that race. They'll make it want something that benefits them or their, their side. If you want to get something objective, what else can you do? Well, first of all, if you don't know what a word means, there's never anything wrong with looking up the That's number one. Secondly, people are not very good at defining things. So when I speak to judges, it's hard to define things. So when I speak to judges, sometimes I'll say, I'll, I'll say that they can't believe it because they think they're good. So we'll just define the word dog. They can't. Of course you can't. My desk dictionary is a picture of a dog with a lamp. So um, that's a good use of dictionaries. Old dictionaries or foreign dictionaries or technical dictionaries, you know, that could do some good. The problem occurs when the, when the issue in the legal case is an issue of vagueness. It's a borderline case of something you're either going to consider it in the category that's in the law or out of the category. And the dictionaries sometimes will seem to include it or not seem to include it, or they do include it. But if you ever ask the lexicographer, they say, well, I included it because it's sort of part of the boundary, but I, gee, I feel a little funny about this. So the dictionaries, typically when they're written, from what I understand, and people in this room can correct me, often lack the level of specificity and subtlety that you need to resolve the particular cases they're being used for. So, what you really want is, so the, the real, the issue is not so much the meaning of the word in some platonic sense, but the issue is what the legislature probably intended, which will be a combination of, of, of English, and there's nothing, you know, the dictionary can help in the ways I suggested. It will also be a, a matter of what the purpose of the law was, which um, some judges try to avoid talking about because they believe that it's not objective and can lead to self-serving um, uh, characterizations and so on. And th that's really where the issues are. So it's not about, you know, there's nothing wrong with dictionaries. Right. It's about they're used for purposes to which they weren't. Right, because I think that, and it's one more is that I think part of the problem is both with language and law. They must be stable, but they can never stand still and do not stand still. If so you have, if, as it is almost running parallel, but usually the law falls behind technology and language and stuff. Sure. So they kind of play catch up. So, but the, the dictionary should be the starting point. They should not be the end all thing because the language is always in flux. But I'm saying, what other starting point can you use? Like you said, you don't hang your hat on the dictionary, so to speak, but you use that as a good starting point we all can, can agree, more or less. And then you say, well. Traditionally, they use what they know about English and the purpose of the statute. So the people know what the word means. Mm -hmm. And if it really mattered whether um, using a, uh, carrying a firearm, whether, you use, whether it's in a vehicle 60% of the time or only 35% of the time, I mean, you know, you can, you can, you can use the dictionary for such purposes. You can your hand up here. I feel oh. like you object to what I said. No, no, I, I just finished the book. And I went through the second, or I'm waiting for the second set of proofs, but about 17th and 18th century dictionaries, and especially the 18th century, art would be like the worst place to start about what a, a word means, because dictionaries and lexicographers were so not neutral, um, and it was so sociolinguistic in, 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 you know, in, in their attempts to sort of fix and hold the language and try to attempt to determine what things meant. But there were social factors and class factors and nationalistic factors that it, there's nothing neutral about these dictionaries, especially, again, in the 18th century. Yes, Johnson, maybe. But afterwards, forget it. 
because they can look at definitions, but what they're going to find is whatever they want to see. And strangely, the only one who appeared to be actually um, authentic was Scalia, not my favorite justice, because he was actually trying to, you know, understand the language as it was meant, because I would be against all of those decisions as you describe them. And if you go back to early dictionaries, all I could say is I used to have uh, Noah Webber, Webster's Compendious Dictionary, and after birth, birth is defined as placenta, which probably doesn't help very much. I wanted to suggest that there is a problem with judges imagining that dictionaries can provide a fixed definition when what they give is a continuum. And if you look at a particularly valuable would be historical dictionaries on historical principles like the OED, although you might not want to, American judges might not want to use it, but look for instance at carry. The word carry can mean 
to simply to transport under your jurisdiction or in your possession, or as it as in driving Miss Daisy, mean to drive somebody somewhere. I'll carry Miss Daisy to the store. Um, so although that's a regional, and it's a regional use, but still. If you look at historical uses, it's still a continuum. Well, it's even worse than that because the judges and their law clerks, as much as they read, they don't read the front matter of the dictionary. There are times where they'll say, you know, that the, the majority cited only the 17th definition without recognizing that the 17th definition is the current definition. And the first definition is one that nobody's used since the 15th century. Well, that doesn't help the cause of justice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it seems to me in every single, uh, everything you've described here today, the dictionary is totally irrelevant to everything that's going on in the courtroom. The purpose of the dictionary in all of these cases was to support a point of view with a particular judge in question. And that is the only thing dictionaries are being used for today. And a dictionary can always be found that will support a particular point of view. But mostly, I mean, I, I, th I mostly agree with that. I mean, as, as I said, sometimes if you want to characterize word meaning, it's pretty hard. And it's a couple of dictionaries that look like they're saying more or less the same thing. And it's, a, and, and it's useful to say, here's what this word means. That's OK. But when you're using it to try to distinguish um, when you have borderline cases, most of these word meaning cases and even phrase meaning cases in law are about vagueness. They're not about different the senses. They're really about more lines. And dictionaries, you know, they sometimes have signals, you know, usually, typically, often, and so on. So there's prototype analysis, you know, within the dictionary definitions. But it, it's really, it's, it's not what they're mostly about. And, I, and, and much of the time, I agree with everything that you just said. Rob? Um, the most important thing I realized that Alan Walker Reed taught us was to read the damn front matter in the dictionary. And it's proved really valuable. For example, in the pods case that I did, I had to very patiently explain to everybody that the fact that something was the first definition did not mean it was the, God help us, correct definition, but and on like that. So we should just do a better job, maybe, of explaining things to the judges. Yes. Uh, are there any judges or any lawyers that <laughs> None that will admit it anyway. <laughs> Are you a mole? Of course. <laughs> I uh, remember the outcome uh, of the battle between Mary and Webster and Random House when they, Random House decided they wanted to put Webster in the title. And at one stage, a judge ruled in favor of I believe it was in it was a long time ago, in favor of uh, Marion Webster on the basis that all dictionaries are read. And that's what? not R E A D. <laughs> they are R E A D. Uh, <laughs> so I, I wanted to go back to the, the, your corpus analysis because it seems like some people at least are thinking that, okay, well, you know, the dictionaries are kind of fuzzy, um, but, they, but, that, um, but that corpus analysis can be objective somehow. And, you know, any, if, if you, you guys have looked at corpora, you know how, you know, simple differences of sampling can make a huge difference in what comes out of the corpus. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so, especially when, it, when we get back to, you know, corpora that are coming from the 18th century, when we don't know what wasn't written down, what was thrown out, what was, you know, what was lost, um, what wasn't chosen for inclusion in this corpus of 18th century English and things like that. So I just want to, you know, I just want to highlight that we have to be very careful about the corpora. It's not like the corpora can give us the answer either. Yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm writing a, a short essay about this project on the record, I, I, um, I support it. There's no reason not to have really, you know, a, a very good learning tool, but the key word in that phrase is tool. And just because you have 100 million words doesn't mean it tells you what to do with them. And there's always decisions that are being made. And those decisions often have to do with lexicography, with what, who the audience of the, of the 
certain principles that are decided linguistically and, and so on, but when you're deciding on a case-by-case -case, case basis, um, and the principles really are how useful it is in a legal context, it makes things very dicey 